Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, good evening and welcome, everybody. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Kolsky, and I am the director of the Albert LePage Center for History and the Public Interest at Villanova University, where I am also an associate professor of history. And tonight marks the final of our year-long series of programming on turning points in history. And uh, for tonight, we're going to be discussing whether the July 11th protests were a turning point in Cuban history. A few kind of logistical notes. This is a Zoom webinar format, so you can see the speakers, but the speakers cannot see you. Um, the panelists will plan to have a conversation for about one hour, and around 7 p.m. we'll turn to your questions. So we encourage you at the bottom of your screen to pose questions in the Q&A box. We'll keep an eye on it. And as I said, around seven o'clock, we'll start to feel those questions. So I will introduce tonight's moderator and then she will introduce the speakers and moderate the event. So I am very, very pleased to have Dr. Hillary um, Sanchez with them again with us tonight. Many of you may remember, she hosted an event for us back in January. Doc, uh, she is a postdoctoral research associate at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. An art historian, uh, she specializes in 20th century Afro-Atlantic material cultures and holds a doctorate in art history from the University of Pennsylvania. Her work has been supported by the Leonard A. Lauder Research Center for Modern Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, as well as the Albert LePage Center for History and the Public Interest. Um, Hillary maintains an active practice working with living artists. In 2015, she co-founded the nationally recognized incubation series training program for artists and curators in the Philadelphia area. And her criticism has been published in Art Margins and Title Magazines. William Sanchez is a recipient of a grant from the Albert LePage Center for History and the Public Interest for her project, Philadelphia Necrographies which considers the collection and display of African material cultures at the Penn Museum. So thank you so much, Hillary, for agreeing to moderate this evening's event. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, thank you to Coco and Maria for joining us this evening. So um, we're going to be talking today um, about the largest anti-government protests on the island of Cuba since 1959 that began on July 11th, 2021, and were ongoing for several months. Um, so today we've brought together Coco Fusco and Maria Cabrera Arus to try and understand this paradoxical convergence of repressive measures like Decree 3 Decree 349, excuse me, um, and the widening access to non-censored information starting around 2018 with the introduction of 3G mobile service on the island. Um, so we're gonna be thinking about the role of artists in Cuban civic life, um, different movements that have proliferated, including 27N and San Isidro, um, and the role of the Communist Party in controlling artistic production um, and innovation in the long term. So first we'll hear from Maria and then we'll hear from Coco and I will introduce them both now so that way we don't interrupt the, the flow of information. So Maria Cabrera Arus has a PhD in sociology from the New School for Social Research and studies the impact of fashion and domestic material culture on regime stability and legitimation with a focus on state socialist regimes and the Caribbean region during the Cold War. Her research has been published in peer reviewed journals such as Theory and Society, Visual Studies and Cuban Studies, as well as book anthologies, including the Oxford Handbook in Communist Visual Culture and The Revolution from Within. She is the author of the multi-awarded project Cuba Material, a digital archive of Cuban material culture from the Cold War era, and curator of the exhibition Pioneros, Building Cuba's Socialist Childhood in the Sheila C. Johnson Design Center at the Parsons School of Design in New York, Cuban Phenotype and its Materiality at Cabinet Magazine, 
and Cuban revolutionary fashion at Brown University. She's an adjunct professor at New York University. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks. Coco Fusco is an interdisciplinary artist and writer. She is a recipient of numerous awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, an American Academy of Arts and Letters Award, a Latinx Art Award, a Fulbright Fellowship, and a Herb Alper Award in the Arts. Her performances and videos have been presented in the 56 Venice Biennale, Free Special Projects, Basel Unlimited, and three Whitney Biennials, including the current one, as well as several other international exhibitions. Her work is in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art, the Walker Art Center, the Centre Pompidou, the Imperial War Museum, and the Museum of Contemporary Art of Barcelona. She is the author of Dangerous Moves, Performance and Politics in Cuba that was published in 2015. She's represented by Alexander Gray Associates in New York and is a professor of art at Cooper Union. She is currently preparing her work for the next Sharjah Biennial and a solo retrospective that will open in 2023. Thank you, Coco, so much for joining us. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Maria. Thank you, Hilary. And Thanks to all the colleagues at the Lipage Center uh, for History at Villanova University. I want to focus my presentation on the historical background that uh, in order for uh, help us to better understand and frame the events of July 11 uh, from last year in Cuba. Um, by the end of my presentation, I will also assess some of the most visible consequences of the protests, and I'm pretty sure that Coco will give an excellent overview of the role that artists play on the uh, protests and in the aftermath of the protests. Now, in terms of the historical background of July 11, some of the long-term causes have to do with the changes that occur in Cuba uh, as, a, as a result of or to face the disappearance of the country's principal political allies during the Cold War, the state socialist regimes of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union or USSR, which was a country with which Cuba maintained over 70% of its foreign trade exchanges in the mid eighties. And the number um, was even higher by the end of the decade, but I don't have the exact figure. In particular, the disintegration of the USSR in 1991 caused, among many things, number one, a major change, and I'm not, the order has nothing to do with, with, with hierarchy or priority, a major change in the ideological discourse of legitimation of the Cuban regime. The Cuba of the 21st century was portrayed in the official discourse as geared toward quote, preserving the socialist conquest, end quote. In, in Spanish, uh, it was uh, framed as preservar las conquistas del socialismo, while at the same time, capitalist economy, uh, the government implemented capitalist economic reforms. That is, I mean uh, by this, that the communist teleology that portrays the socioeconomic system of communism as the most advanced world system and uh, remember that uh, the idea was that the human civilization evolved from primitive community to, towards feudalism, then towards capitalism, then, then towards socialism, and eventually towards uh, communism, which was the most advanced of them all. This ideology was abandoned for a pragmatic ideology that was mainly oriented to the survival, to guarantee the survival of the regime. As a result of this mm, change of narrative, um, the modernizing discourses that were so central to the grand narrative of communism were abandoned or in the best case postponed for a new or an old but recovered revolutionary nationalistic discourse that took again center stage. I'm going to share my screen with you to show you some images. So uh, we can see here in this first slide um, the, the change in the uh, visual expression of this uh, narrative. Uh, the first banknote, this is, these are two banknotes. The first one was minted in 1975 on occasion of the celebration of the first Congress of the Cuban Communist Party. And this was a special edition. And you see that, you know, uh, the industrialization and modernization discourse, it was cr uh, uh, clearly uh, um, 
express in the in the uh, in the bank in the bank in the, in the bill and then we have a, a, to the to the right a bank note that was minted in 2012 and we see a recovery of this revolutionary symbols you see Che Guevara uh, at the cane quarters and this nationalistic and, and revolutionary imaginary however the visual imaginary accompanying the new revolutionary discourses, these uh, new revolutionary uh, nationalistic discourses, and in particular the actors who articulated them, were not only aged by the turn of a century, but they were also associated with a past from which many Cubans, including and especially artists, had already begun to distance themselves. A second consequence of the collapse of the communist regimes was the erosion of some of the mechanisms of state surveillance and control, including the bureaucratic panopticon, which was affected by daily blackouts, lack of paper, and the disappearance of state institutions, such as the Instituto Cubano de Investigación y Orientación de la Demanda Interna, which was an institution subordinated to the Central Committee of the Communist Party and that was dedicated to do research on consumption and demand. Uh, the grip the government had on individuals and society lessened in some ways due to this transformation. In particular, the most subtle mechanism of control, such as the variegated web of institutions and forms of bureaucratic classification, measuring, and control of the population, such as the institutional registries for the collection of personal data, the system of state diplomas and awards, and the intricate, intricate web of IDs. And I'm going, I'm going to show you here some. The intricate web of IDs, some of which granted privilege, such as chopping in a special days in the case of the IDs that were given to workers, or fishing offshore in the case of the IDs for the members of the Asociación Cubana de la Pesca Deportiva. Um, and you can see here, so some of these IDs and, and, and registries and documents ceased to be produced because of the lack of paper, because of the crisis, because of the institution that, that, that um, granted those documents disappear as well. A third major transformation that the Cuban society endured at the end of the Cold War was the erosion of the elitist or privileged position that members of the Communist Party and the military had previously enjoyed. This was a result of the state prioritization of international tourism and foreign investments, the increasing reliance on remittances from the US, the legalization of private employment and the legal circulation of the US law, dollar, which also greatly benefited artists in the first place, or at least at the beginning, and the widespread reliance on the black market to satisfy basic, need, basic needs. A fourth and last change has to do with the conspicuous display of many of the shortcomings, shortcomings of the socialist economy, manifested among other areas in I'm gonna, I have a slide to here. Uh, so manifested among may other areas in the bad quality of the mass consumer goods that were produced by the state in the low productivity of state enterprises on the rising figures of work absenteeism. And these were problems that already existed in the 80s and the 70s and even in the 60s, but they became even, even more acute from the 1990s onwards and were accompanied by a visible deterioration of the quality of the healthcare, the education system, and the social welfare programs. For instance, state workers' income and pensions were insufficient to sustain a minimum living standard. So on July 31st, 2006, Fidel Castro announced that due to his deteriorating health, he would temporarily hand over his power to his brother, Raul Castro. A year and a half later, on February 19, 2008, Fidel Castro resigned as head of the Cuban government. And on April 19, 2011, he also handed over the leadership of the Communist Party to his brother, Raul. Under the Raul Castro administration, the system of social welfare was further dismantled. Inequality grew to levels never registered before. And I'm referring here to the period after 1959, of course. 
for instance, workers in areas of strategic importance, such as the military, and to a certain extent also the healthcare workers were entitled to material privilege, higher incomes, and access to consumer goods in high demand, such as furniture and housing, in, in, in levels that uh, uh, surpass those that were um, granted before the uh, economic crisis that occurred as a consequence of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. The government also, um, there were also massive layouts due to the closing of the state enterprises. Uh, and as it was already mentioned, the government allowed free travel abroad and internet service on mobile phones and households uh, for the first time, yet under close and strict control by the state. However, some dissidents and members, and this I think must be noted, members of the civil society were denied these rights. For instance, independent journalists, I'm gonna mention just two, but there were there are many other, Abraham Jimenez uh, Enoa, who originally uh, was a direct, initially was the director of El Estornudo and independent media, was banned from traveling abo abroad for more than five years. He's now in Spain, but another independent journalist, Luz Escobar, who works for Catorce y Medio, another independent um, newspaper is still denied that right. On the other hand, the end of the state monopoly on information and travel lessened the government control on the information that circulated in society and contributed to the development of a sound independent press that complemented and in some cases substituted former alternatives such as the paquete and the illegal parabolic antennas that proliferated in the 90s. So this is a, a, an overview of some of the uh, independent media that uh, exists uh, currently uh, in Cuba and to which Cubans uh, had abroad had access and in some cases within Cuba, but they have to go through a VP protocol and, and you know, in order to sort out, sort out the, the, the censorship of the Cuban government. Another element that characterizes the Raul administration is the deacceleration or abandonment of a long prom of long promised economic reforms, including those necessary to materialize the thought that President Obama initiated by the end of his administration. This, the, 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 the lack of the implementation of actual reforms by, um, by Castro convinced many in Cuba that there was a total lack of interest on the Cuban leadership in a sound economic reform that would make life in Cuba livable for the majority. A similar impact may have had the in the political sphere, in particular, the, 19, the 2019 constitutional reform. During the constitutional referendum that the government uh, um, organized, and in we from which the Cubans who live in abroad were excluded, most independent media outlets were blocked by the Cuban regime in order to curtail free debate on the, on, the, on the new constitution. The government also failed to implement popular reforms such as the same in the new constitution that was finally approved, that they failed to implement popular uh, reforms such as the uh, legalization of same-sex marriage, and a series of laws that would guarantee the necessary freedom for artistic expression. And I'm, I am pretty sure that Coco is going to uh, explain more in detail. This situation convinced many that a democratization from above, or at least with the uh, support of the uh, current regime, would never take place in Cuba. Another circumstance leading to the protests of the July 11 has to do with the generational change and the growing numbers of young Cubans who grew up unfamiliar with the socialist rhetoric, the revolutionary institutions, and even uninfluenced by uh, the figure of Fidel Castro himself. So this is a map of the uh, Cuban population uh, um, right now. And we can see that this is from 30 to 34 years old. Uh, it is almost half or more than 30% of the Cuban population. Um, another element characteristic of, oh, I'm sorry, 
Compared with the previous generations, younger Cubans are less interested in politics and more in, are more fluent in the global escapes. And I'm using here the Arjana Padurai's ex, the concept of escapes, including not only the global brand scapes, which Cubans in the island are very familiar with, but also the ideal escapes of the cultural and social uh, movements, such as those that uh, for uh, more racial equality, environmental protection, animal rights, and the LGBTQ movement. All of which young Cubans consume all, the, all of these ideas through social media and interpersonal transnational exchanges. Young Cubans are also more prone to use technology, not only to connect with their peers, but also to organize as, as the origin story of the July 11 protest, which was published by journalist Carla Colomé from the independent media Lestornudo demonstrates. Uh, it was uh, uh, organized, or at least it was initiated through a Facebook group. Another example is the Archipelago platform based on social, on, on which was, uh, it was born in, on social media and it was created to organize and promote the Corte protest plan for November 15. Last but not least, the economic hostility and isola uh, isolationist policy of the Trump administration, along with the coronavirus epidemics, caused a severe economic crisis in the island, only comparable to the special period of the 1990s, and uh, which was manifested in the collapse of the healthcare system, the fall of the GDP, and a widespread severe scarcity. I will conclude by assessing the impact of the July 11 events on contemporary Cuba, focusing on two major outcomes. Uh, there are many more, but I want to just mention these two. On the one hand, the sanctioning and, to a certain extent, the normalization of both old and new forms of state violence. This includes the watershed announcement of the combat order by President Diaz-Canel as his first response to the July 11 protest. He later back up, but uh, his first uh, reaction was to say that the quote, end quote, combat order was given. The resorting again to actos de repudio or repudiation acts in which figures of the opposition are publicly blamed, insulted, and attacked by mobs of neighbors. The use of sticks and brass knuckles by the contingents the government deployed to dissolve, to dissolve pacific protesters. The display of sophisticated anti-riot equipment for the first time in public by the police forces. The systemic arrest of dissidents, most notably, I mean, this happens all over again in, in cycles, most notably Luis Manuel Otero, Otero Cantara and my, me, Michael Osorbo, who are currently in prison. The very long prison sentences given to protesters, so far there has been tried 790 people and 55 of them are underage, are minors, and the prison sensors are, are, are insane. On the other hand, the most recent resorting by the Cuban government once more to the mass exodus as a solution to domestic political discontent is another outcome to consider uh, after the uh, July 11 protests. This has taken, this, this exodus has taken the form of I mean, the, 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 the exodus as a solution has taken the form of the forced exile of activists, dissidents, and political organizers. Most of them are currently outside of Cuba or in prison in Cuba. Or, and the provision of facilities for emigration and mass emigration through ne the negotiation of uh, agreements with Nicaragua for that resulted in the elimination of the visa requirement for Cuban nationals and lately the authorization of the sales of boats and accessories. This was previously banned and it was uh, announced, it was promoted as for navigate, safe for navigation at sea. We haven't seen the, uh, the, any consequence of this because this was recent last week, last week but um, um, I wouldn't be surprised if a uh, 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 mass exodus by sea is also uh, uh, occurs. The diasporization of political discontent, however, and this is my uh, strong belief, uh, may and should be used for the benefit of Cuban civil society and democratization. In particular, the access that living up outside of uh, abroad uh, give 
to international fora, platforms, and institutions, to resources such as the much needed funds, training, and media exposure, and to forms of organization that are free from the interfer interference and espionage of the Cuban regime. Patria y Vida, the music of the revolt, was a concerted effort of Cubans living in the island and abroad. The performance of Yoduel Romero in the song's video clip, where he appears half naked, demanding, where he appears half naked, demanding political change in his country of birth, only anticipated the demand of one of the July 11 protesters, a, a, an old lady who screamed in front of a camera phone. We took off the clothes of silence. In Espanol, nos quitamos el ropaje del silencio. Thanks. So, Coco, I will uh, sit it, the, the, the mic to you. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Maria Antonia. That was great. Um, and especially, like, I, the data on the blockage super cool data that you have. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen here. Why, why it does this? It just says who can share like it's asking me and I, I want to share my screen. Okay, here we go. So yes, I um, was asked to talk about artists in relationship to this and I have been uh, Doing lots of presentations of this kind, I try to update as much as I can. Um, so, and uh, also we're kind of tight for time here, so I'll try to be brief. But I wanted to uh, kind of, there is a before and after in terms of the Cuban art scene and uh, of July 11th. Um, although the artists were not the protagonists of July 11th, the artists in Cuba and the artists working, Cuban artists working outside Cuba, but on activism did not generate this protest. Um, they were caught completely by surprise. Nonetheless, the state is wants to blame artists for the protests because of the history of artists driven protests prior to July 11th. Um, well, what they, and they have been uh, over the last three or four years, trying to blame artists more and more for increasing generalized unrest. And whereas this in other decades might have frightened uh, 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 artists away from identification with dissent. I uh, you know, started uh, visiting Cuba 35 years ago. And at the time, uh, you know, the artists that I interacted with who could be very outspoken with the authorities, nonetheless tried to keep a very strict a barrier between what they did and whatever was considered dissenting acti political activism and dissent activity. But that has not been the case um, in the last couple of years, that these uh, the government's pressure on the artists and the demonization of their activity has actually encouraged a lot of these artists to strengthen their identification with uh, popular discontent. So I'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this, just very quickly, this is work by uh, Lilium Dooley, um, and uh, what she's doing with these is to take classic examples of Cuban posters from the 60s and 70s that have been exhibited all over the world um, and retool them um, and kind of culture jam them to infuse them with content related to the present day. So uh, Derechos Robados was originally Besos Robados or Stolen Kisses and now it's Stolen Rights. The, the free Angela posters that were produced in the early 70s when Angela Davis was um, on trial, well, first in prison and then uh, well, in jail and then on trial, um, are now, uh, you know, superimposed on that is the face of Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara. Uh, and just, you know, very quickly, the one at the end with the uh, rose, which is a famous Cuban poster, but is now retooled to uh, speak of the proposal uh, that was made by the Archipelago group once upon a time led by the dramatist uh, Junior Garcia to have a mass uh, protest on the 15th of November last year. So the artists kind of most uh, uh, frequently repeated phrase, 
in relationship to their particular activist movements is the right to have rights. And they borrow this term from Hannah Arendt from the origins of totalitarianism. Uh, my, I, I, I'm, I'm fairly sure that this was originally introduced by Tanya Ruguera because her uh, institute is named after uh, Hannah Arendt and also because in 2015, she did a performance piece in her house um, in which she read the origin out loud the origins of totalitarianism from her living room with a loudspeaker onto the street. She was not allowed to leave the house at the time. Anyway, the phrase um, was in the past uh, invoked to refer to refugees and marginalized groups in Western democracies um, whose uh, uh, access to citizens' rights was under assault. The Cubans use it slightly differently. They talk about the, I, the assault on citizen agency by an authoritarian state. So it's not about uh, uh, rights that are taken away. It's about rights that aren't even recognized. OK, so the, they are referring there to prohibitions on dissent, opposition, political parties, which are not permitted, independent press or unions. Those are not permitted. And the uh, per pervasive per police repression. So Arendt's original strategy was to point to inadequacies of institutional mechanisms in Western democracies to protect these rights. The Cuban artivists are talking about um, the, you know, the lack of um, institutional mechanisms, uh, not inadequacies, the total lack, okay? And here we have a poster uh, by Edel Rodriguez, the wonderful uh, illustrator whose works are on the cover of national magazines all over the world, like Time and, uh, you know, uh, uh, all newspapers in Germany and so on and so forth. Um, this is a poster that he made calling for uh, the uh, re re uh, throwing out the Minister of Culture, Alpidio Alonso, and I'll explain why in a little bit. So uh, I want to think about, I mean, obviously, politics is not a movie or a play. But there is a dramatic thread to the dramas of the last couple of years in terms of the conf confrontations between artists and the state and also between the citizenry and the state. And uh, I would argue that um, with the advent, with the increasing access to the Internet in Cuba since 2008 and then um, the arrival of Internet to cell phones in 2018, that those involved in act, uh, activism have gotten increasingly aware of the role of the image in communicating uh, uh, certain kinds of political ideas um, and that they are using uh, and dramatizing uh, the conflict with the straight state through their actions. Um, I wrote a little bit about this in Dangerous Moves, but that has influenced me to think about the images of resistance that resonate and circulate and the soundtrack of resistance that also uh, resonates and circulates. Uh, so I just pick a couple of examples here of images of resistance that have gone viral in the last uh, few months. This is, uh, first of all, Michael Osorbo, who in April of uh, 2021 was in the San Isidro neighborhood. The police came and tried to arrest him. And the neighbors from the neighborhood came out and prevented the police from finishing putting on the handcuffs in the street and to push the police away from Michael. And in a, one moment, he raises his fist up with the, um, you know, the, the handcuff hanging off of it and somebody snaps a picture with the cell phone. This goes viral. It's in all sorts of music videos now. It's all over. It's been printed a million times in um, different Cuban uh, independent uh, media uh, outlets and so on is a representation of a kind of defiance of the people in the face of police. And this might not surprise an American because there's, you know, since the days of the Panthers, there's been all sorts of attempts to kind of intervene when people think that police are getting out of control. But in Cuba, this was really unheard of for this to be this level of citizen resistance um, in public to the police. Uh, then you have uh, this image of the last performance that Luis Manuel was uh, did in April of last year um, on the occasion of the 8th Communist Party Congress. He uh, strapped himself to a garrote, which is a 
tool for punishment that was used during the Inquisition, but was also used very often against slaves. Um, and he strapped himself there while the part the Communist Party was having their you know, shindig um, as a kind of uh, dramatic gesture representing the status of the Cuban people vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the articulations of political will that were coming from above. And then uh, the here at the bottom, this is from the award ceremony at the Latin Grammys last November when uh, uh, Gente de Sona, Yotuel, De Semer Bueno, and El Funky, who was the only member of the Cuban team of Patria Vida who was able to get out of the country, are on stage all in white, you know, um, the, 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 the color used to represent peace, but also resistance. This is, remember, the ladies in white also. Um, and the backdrop to them was an image of La Habana Vieja, of old Havana, as if, to, as if to imagine themselves back in their country, singing from their country uh, to the world. Um, and this is, you know, on the, on the occasion of their winning um, the Grammy Award, two Latin Grammys, one for the best song, and then I think best urban was the other one that they won. So uh, those images come on the tails of a, a, a kind of two or three years of developing agitation from the artist sector um, in relationship to the state. And uh, you know what has been picked up on is the emergence of movements with names, right? But a lot of the dissenting activity has not necessarily been tied to these movements, but these are the names that are out there and the rest of the world gets excited when the art artists actually get organized so that you can kind of imagine this as a political force. Uh, so the first is uh, the uh, founding of the San Isidro movement in 2018. Uh, this was a group of largely self-taught artists, musicians, rappers, uh, spoken word poets, uh, dramatists, uh, who what they shared was either that they were self-taught or, or had been kicked out of institutions. Some of them had been kicked out of uh, the, the people, the, some of the artists had been kicked out of their studios in this cultural center in Alamar. Others had lost their job at uh, the University of the Arts um, and so on and so forth. So they are sort of the rejects, right? The social and political rejects that are banding together. They, Some of them had worked together before, they knew each other, they had organized this uh, independent art biennial together, but the decision to form the movement was a response to the uh, announcement of De Decree 349, which was an attempt by the government through law to criminalize independent cultural activity that was trying to make itself known without prior organization, uh, authorization from the state. Uh, and they launched a series of protests were quite media savvy in the way that they went about uh, carrying out these protests that uh, awakened the rest of the arts community to the implications of this um, of this decree. Um, the way the Cuban legal system works is the laws are announced in this publication, La Gaceta de Cuba, that is, I think, related to the judiciary. And then there's a six month period before the law goes into effect. So they were using those six months right, uh, to uh, try to politicize the rest of the arts community and to rise up against the law. The other movement that's gotten a lot of attention is called 27N. Uh, it's called 27N because it was founded the night of the 27th of November of uh, 2020, when hundreds of cultural workers from a range of fields uh, gathered in front of the Ministry of Culture for more than 15 hours to demand uh, some kind of confrontation with uh, officials of the cultural ministry because of the break in to the headquarters of the San Isidro movement the night before and the arrest of everybody who was in there, including several hunger strikers who were then taken to hospitals and essentially force fed. So, uh, as a result of the sit in, which was done not necessarily spontaneously because people were communicating, but in such a short period of time, uh, the people came together that it did not give the authorities or the security apparatus enough advance notice to be able to stop them. So uh, they were able to gather and concentrate there in front of the ministry and that pressured those who were inside to 
respond in the moment without asking for permission from the uh, above, the powers uh, above them. And uh, that led to a two or three hour meeting after which uh, the 30 delegates who were voted to go in and talk to the ministers came out and had uh, you know, read the list of demands that they had presented and so on and so forth. And out of this comes 27N. Then we go to the soundtracks of resistance. Oh, and what just one point I should remember is that remember that they are artists. They're very image conscious. They're very image savvy. They take a lot of pictures of themselves. So we know a lot more about them than we do about some of the other political activists who are not so image conscious and are not so image savvy, but may be equally active. But we don't get to know as much because they don't take as much. They don't spend as much time on their image and on circulating their image. Going on to the soundtracks of resistance. Um, this has been absolutely criti critical for galvanizing the general population, particularly the pop young people who make up the majority of those that protested on July 11th. Um, people listen to a lot of music in Cuba. There's You can hear music in the street. And uh, one of the things that um, has happened in the last 10 or 15 years with um, a number of things, the uh, possibility of the elimination of uh, exit visas, the exit visa requirement that allowed a lot of people to travel without having to be sanctioned by the straight state in order to travel, uh, the increasing access to internet has meant that musicians who want to make music that is critical of the government don't have to use the government mechanisms or channels to produce or to circulate their work. Right. So, uh, you know, there are some rappers who work with state uh, media producers, and then there are many others who either they go to Miami or Mexico or Spain or wherever, buy equipment and bring it back or their friends bring it in. They build studios in their homes. They produce their music and then they distribute online. Um, in the case of Patri Vida, which is the song that is has become the anthem of uh, dissent in Cuba, this was a collaboration between artists inside and outside. It was uh, put on YouTube, so it's freely accessed, and you know everybody in Cuba could download it in theory. Or you know if you don't have internet, if you're one of the people that doesn't have internet, although most young people do find a way to get it. Somebody else will download it for you and copy it, and then you can have a copy in your house. So those the songs are key for giving people a language with which to articulate their discontent in an environment that in which you know access to dissident information is highly limited. And also, you know, one historically, one of the problems that dissidents have had has been to not have that much uh, uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, like the, the general public doesn't pay that much attention to dissidents, but the general public paid a lot of attention to Patri Vida and other contestatory songs. So um, I just have a couple of examples here that were important songs last year. Uh, De Cuba Soy by Yomilidani. Uh, there was a great music video uh, that Yumit Ramirez, a Cuban independent filmmaker made, he's now in Spain, and he put on the cell phones footage from the protests, and then the song is sung by these historical figures. Here you see Jose Martí, but also Antonio Maceo appears, uh, 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 Celia Cruz, um, Dulce, Dulce Maria Loinas, the poet, uh, La Lupe, uh, all, all sorts of historical figures and celebrities from Cuban history appear in this video and you know their mouths are am animated. So it looks like they are singing uh, this song of resistance against the government. And then this one, Oye Policia Pinga, which you know you can literally means, hey, penis police, but really what it means is screw you cop, okay? Uh, was also being sung during the protest. There are video, there's video footage where you see people saying, Oye Policia Pinga, to the rhythm of the song. Okay, so uh, as well as singing Patri Vida, which is sung all the time in defiance of police all over Cuba, and it's also graffitied on walls. And then authorities go and paint over it and people come out and write it again. Uh, so just a little bit more detail about the Patri Vida story. So, you know, this is a, uh, a play on the Fidel's famous phrase, Patri Muerte, Fatherland under death, venceremos, we will win. Uh, it's here, it's fatherland and life. Right. Uh, and, you know, it's basically the message of the song of the lyrics of the song is that we don't want to feel like we have to give our lives over 
and literally sacrifice our lives, our happiness, our well-being, our health to this lie, right? And the song, and the song, the lyrics openly talk about lies being told to people and having to live a sham and uh, being sick of it and wanting to change things and rebuild the country that has been destroyed by the people in power. So it's a pretty direct hit um, to the authorities that are currently about tomorrow to sit down with the State Department of the United States to talk about immigration. So this song got a million hits on YouTube in the first week, 3.3 million hits in the first month. And the last time I checked, it was at 10.5 million. It might be more. It is inspired by the San Isidro movement hunger strike that was on November 26th that also inspired the protest on November 27th. It, they won two Latin Grammys, even though the Cuban government tried to intervene and complain and stop it from happening, they couldn't stop it from happening. It's a collaboration between Cuban musicians outside and inside Cuba. The government, in reaction to this song, I mean, first they talked about it being bad taste. They used sort of older strategies of saying, you know, this is bad taste, this is bad, or it's counter-revolutionary. They've tried every single way to kind of diminish its importance. But the bottom line is that everybody in Cuba knows this song and everybody in Cuba knows who sang it. And the people are, it is a clear articulation of a rupture between the citizenry and the state. And in retaliation for this, the government has arrested everybody involved who they could get their hands on. So Michael Osorbo has been in prison since April of last year. Luis Manuel has been in prison since July of last year. And Angelo Troya, who is the cameraman in the picture on the right, uh, was also arrested during the protest, given a sentence. And then I guess because of the outcry, um, it was changed from a sentence that had to be served in prison to uh, uh, a sentence, meaning that he has to be under house arrest. And Funky was the only one who managed to get out of the country before they figured out a way to put him away. So what are some of the images of state repression? Remember the, the whole thing about, oh, getting 3G on your phone. What does that mean for Cubans? It means you can see pictures of what goes on in your country in real time. That is the most important thing that catalyzed all these protests that prior to that, you would have to wait a while, you'd have to wait for somebody who had internet access to download something and then give it to you, or you'd have to hear about it or somebody would call you and tell you a story. But the history of circulating unofficial information has always been that it's slow and only accessible to a few and you know taking forever to spread and difficult to verify. Now, since 2018, you got a phone in your hand, there are Wi Fi spots all over the island, you turn it on, and you can see what's happening all over the place. And, you know, sometimes they, the Cubans use Facebook for this, but basically, you know, it, it can pop up in your, in, in any number of accounts that Cubans might have on their phones. And it was the images of the break into Luis Manuel Otero's house um, in San Isidro, the violent break into the house, dragging people out by the hair, arresting them, uh, the hunger strikers, that catalyzed the protest of the artist. It was the, um, and it continued images of physical aggression by the state against members of the artist community that has politicized the artist more and more and more, um, and also generated the desire to participate more in street action and to uh, confront the street this, uh, more. So you have first the attack on November 26, 2020, then the images of Luis Manuel, who was forcibly hospitalized um, after one of his hunger strikes in April 2021, where it, uh, you know he, he was not allowed to speak in any of these videos. They were all produced by state security. They were extremely worrisome. He looked really kind of deranged in the pictures. Uh, there was also the confrontation in January of 2021 when a number of artists from the 27N movement went back to the Ministry of Culture to inquire about colleagues of theirs who were uh, being harassed. And uh, the Minister of Culture came out to the street where many of them were standing and physically attacked those who were out there and knocked the phone out of the hand of an uh, independent journalist. Uh, and that then caused the artist to try to call for his uh, uh, 
stepping down from his position and uh, you know constant also uh, uh, representations on social media by the artists of mob attacks on uh, members of 27N, like the attack on uh, Tanya Rivera here, and of surveillance of their homes. Uh, so, you know, this is, you start to see more and more images of this, of people being uh, arrested when they leave their homes, people not able to leave their homes, it's videos of the uh, security agents uh, at the lobby of the building of Luz Escobar and other buildings and so on. This is, you know, all over social media every day. Um, and then it, you've got uh, also the case of Hamlet La Bastida, who was in Germany when uh, most of these protests were going on. He was in an artist residency. He came back in June 2021. Uh, to deal with paperwork, because if you're Cuban and you want to keep your Cuban citizenship, you have to show up every two years. He comes back and he's immediately arrested. And the, the accusation that was made was that he had uh, instigated people to commit a crime because he had discussed an idea for an artwork on a private chat. Um, the artwork was never made, but he was nonetheless arrested on this basis. And uh, detained for three months in Via Marista, which is the headquarters of Cuban state security, during which there was a huge campaign uh, on the internet and elsewhere for his release. And he has a son who lives in Poland. And one of the things that the mother of the son did was to have the kid on Facebook, you know, with posters all the time, asking for his father to be released. Uh, we have start to see uh, expulsions from the country of uh, the members of 27N and uh, the San Isidro movement. Uh, the art historian and curator, uh, Ana Meli Ramos, uh, she was abroad, she was doing a doctorate in Mexico and then came to the United States last fall and she has been refused re-entry to, um, to Cuba. Uh, and so now she is stateless because she doesn't have permission to stay in the United States anymore and she can't go back to Mexico anymore because they haven't renewed her visa and she can't go back to her country. Carolina Barrero, one of the members of 27N, um, had stayed for much longer than many of the other activists who have been leaving in the last uh, few months. But she was uh, recently uh, in the early February, basically threatened that if she continued to support the parents of minors who were arrested in uh, on the 11th of July, that those parents would be uh, arrested because of her. And so she was given 48 hours to leave the country and she went to Spain. So, you know, what a lot of people ask me um, often is, so is this kind of resistance from the artists exceptional? Like, is this what they always do or not, right? And is this level of repression unusual or not? And uh, my response to that is that there are aspects of this that are exceptional. Um, there, uh, this internet-based communication granted a lot more autonomy and visibility to independent Cuban culture um, and than it had before. Um, it doesn't have to worry so much about um, you know, it doesn't have to pay as, play as much of a cat and mouse game with the government in terms of being present, even if the agents of that presence are playing a cat and mouse government with the authorities. In other words, you don't have to worry about how to build an illegal printing press in your house. You just put it on the internet and the Cuban government for one reason or another hasn't figured out a way to prevent people from doing that. So they have more visibility. That is um, exceptional. Um, also, the demands that artists are making from 27N and San Isidro movement are not limited to exclusively artistic concerns. So it's not just about I want to have a better contract with the government or I want to have uh, make it easier for me to travel or I want to have a bank account in Spain and you have to let me do it. It's more they're talking about civil rights now. So they're talking about rights that would apply in theory to the general population. So that's a different level of um, resistance. And um, the, the fact that the Internet is on phones as opposed to computers means that there's a lot bigger national audience for all independent culture. And that facilitates activism. Because if you can communicate with people around you really quickly, you can mobilize them really quickly. You can't do that when you don't have the, don't have the internet on phones. So you see, uh, when the protest started in 2018, against Decree 349, the focus was on the impact on artists because the law was targeting artists. By 2020, the artists are now starting to use those 
same activist tactics to talk about police killings of Afro-Cubans who are not artists. And at present, the most, uh, I guess, visible move activist movement involving some members of the artistic community is to support the families of those who were arrested on the 11th of July, which is entirely giving over your artistic skills and your cultural skills and your communicative skills to a political cause that is not necessarily your own. OK, why are artists protesting more? Because um, one of the things that a lot of foreigners have questioned me on in the past is this idea that, well, you know, like artists have it really good in Cuba. Their uh, school is free. Their materials are free. They, you know, it's all based on merit. And they, you know, Cuban artists are in Venice and Sao Paulo and here and there. And they show in New York and they have nothing to complain about. They have a lot more support than other artists in Latin America. I've heard that very often. Um, what started to happen in 2018 was the introduction of laws that criminalize independent cultural activity, generalized the repression against, in theory, the entire artistic community. Even though the Ministry of Culture higher ups met with artists who they consider to be their more cooperative and you know more uh, prestigious members to try to assure them that 349 really wasn't for them, and what they were told in a closed door meeting was this is for the tacky guys who do reggaeton and you know basically this is for poor black artists it's not for you okay um even though they were told that the artists many of the artists who were at that meeting didn't accept that as the truth they said no this is for anybody who has a studio in their house or a gallery in their house or a, uh, a production company running out of their house, you guys can barge in at any time, shut us down, take our equipment, arrest us, fine us and all of this, just because some guy from Poder Popular says so, right? So that is a shift in the state's tactic away from isolating individuals as troublemakers to targeting an entire sector. Um, and that is a direct attack on a burgeoning independent art, music, and journalism uh, sector that was growing of, uh, at, since 2008, if not before. Um, there's also the frustrated expectations that had been generated by the Obama era rapprochement between Cuba and the United States. Many young uh, 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 journalists have said this to me in particular, that they were expecting uh, after the Obama visit, which was then followed by the visit of many uh, philanthropists, American philanthropists to the island, and the, they started, these younger people started getting grants from uh, Open Society, Ford, and, uh, and so on, uh, and many other uh, entities for their independent uh, publications, uh, that they were expecting things to continue on that road, and then instead what they see from the Cuban government is more and more of a clampdown. And so that was uh, that increased the frustration. Um, there's also a shrinking public sector under Raul Castro's leadership, and that meant less investment in cultural institutions. So whereas 20 years ago, it might have been easier to sell your artwork to the Museum of Fine Arts in Cuba, they have much less of a budget for acquisition. So and the art school has less money. All I mean, Ikaik has no money. Uh, so all of these entities that still have a kind of repressive role and power over artists have less to give. And that's going to pr uh, push artists away from the state to look for other options. Um, and then finally, you know, the 1990s during the special period, the arts community had experienced a mass exodus at the very beginning of the special period because of a wave of repression between 1989 and 91. Um, in response to this, as a kind of measure to control, to stop the flow outward, uh, there, uh, you know, the, the, the Ministry of Culture started to kind of try to make concession like agreements with artists and say, well, you know, you'll be able to travel and you'll be able to do this and we'll take care of you and we'll do that if you keep your mouth shut and, you know, don't make trouble for us, right? Uh, but also in more, in more general terms, Fidel Castro was compelled at that point to legalize dollar possession. And that led to uh, the creation of more and more independent business endeavors and the arts community was at the forefront of that. They were among the first uh, professionals allowed to make direct sales in hard currency um, and to have hard, possess hard currency and to in 
engage without mediation by the state in these transactions. And so that the mere fact of their being able to do that then creates a kind of self-perception that they are more autonomous from the state. And when you feel more autonomous from the state, you feel you're more likely to be critical of the state than if you feel like the state controls your entire life. So I'm, I'm gonna try to move quickly because uh, I know I'm going on for too long, the forms of repression, there's escalating police and paramilitary violence, which uh, we've seen in the media, it's widely reported. Uh, Tomas Edson, who was a Cuban painter who left in the early 90s, mentioned in a show with uh, uh, Wendy Guerra on CNN uh, not that long ago that he noted that in his generation, to be censored meant that you get your hand slapped and your show shut, and now it means going to prison. So he sees that the level of punishment has gone up against artists. The new penal code is in criminalizing oppositional posts on social media. Uh, the state propaganda, uh, you know, is constantly uh, running shows that demonize the artists. The most famous of these is this uh, show with Umbertico Lopez, who, in addition to being a TV personality is a member of the Council of State. So he's a politician and a TV star. Um, and he spends a lot of time demonizing artists and accusing them of being on the payroll to the CIA. Silvio Rodriguez's tactic is a little bit more subtle. What he does is to try to normalize censorship by means of false analogies. So he was on this uh, sh cultural show talking about Corbet's origin of the world painting and saying that it was censored, but it wasn't shown publicly. It wasn't censored by the state. On, on, uh, and, it, and, and its actual censorship wasn't until 1988, but he's saying, you know, he was saying on TV, well, a hundred years ago or something, they did this and now we do that, everybody censors, but it's a, not um, an accurate analogy. So what are some of the biggest problems at the moment? Uh, uh, Maria mentioned this, that there are so many political prisoners in Cuba again. Uh, so this is the most recent report that I found from April of this year that there are 1,027 political prisoners, 891 are from the 11th of July protests, 38 are minors. Uh, the sentencing being handed out now is up to 30 years for sedition. Some people are being accused of sedition. 652 prisoners have been sentenced, 259 of them with sentences of more than 10 years. And remember that the majority of those who participated in the protests and the majority of those who are in prison are young people under the age of 30. Um, among, the, uh, and among the crazy sentences uh, is uh, the now proposed sentence for Michael Osorbo of 10 years, for Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara of seven years. Uh, the musician Abel Lescai was just sentenced to six years. The influencer El Gato de Cuba just got two years. And uh, I wrote this uh, like last week or a week or two ago that the proposed sentence for rapper Randy Artiaga was seven, but I just read today that he's got um, he's gotten five uh, from his uh, tr recent trial. So that's that's the sad story. This is a very dark moment. It is not a happy moment. Thank you both so much for this um, really important and complex um, explanation of kind of the recent past um, and the kind of longer, longer ish past. Um, so I want to start with um, kind of the prompt. Um, for the series that the LePage Center is um, focused on this year of different moments as potential turning points. And of course, neither of you can predict the future, <laughs> but um, based on kind of your understanding as experts, do you think that this um, is a moment of change for um, people on the island. I mean, Coco, you kind of talked a bit about how you think this is exceptional, um, but I, I would love to hear from both of you kind of what your understanding is of um, how this might eventually kind of play out in, in the future, either the immediate future, like are we going to see more activity, um, you know, civil civil unrest or disobedience or or not? Maria, you want to start? 
Yes, I, I will start. Uh, well, I won't predict the future, but I would say that, uh, yes, I, I do think that it is a, a watershed moment disregarding of whatever outcomes will uh, occur in the future. And by this, I mean a democratic uh, transition, uh, a revolution, or any other possible outcome. Disregarding whatever occurs, I think it is already a watershed moment because first, the Cuban government lost the, uh, um, the regime lost the uh, exceptionality uh, quality that had uh, so far uh, identified and justified many of the policies and the uh, abuses implemented in the name of, you know, social justice, uh, uh, the, 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 the David against Goliath, uh, this discourse and this exceptionality kind of go, was uh, uh, um, eroded or slightly uh, changed or, or, or obliterated in a way. Also, the Cuban society, I think that civil society learned to organize. And this is something I think is important other than, as Coco mentioned, the fact that uh, cell phones allow gay Cubans the possibility to immediately communicate and get news, also allow Cubans to communicate. And, and for instance, platforms such as Telegram and WhatsApp are very, very popular among Cubans. And you don't only get the news of what's going on, but you also know where to go, who to see. Uh, and I remember when um, November 27, when people gather outside of the Ministry of Culture uh, and the police and uh, there were police deployed around and, and, and protesters were surrounded and people could not, I mean, new people who wanted to join those who were uh, at the Ministry of Culture were not allowed to get in and they uh, use, uh, pepper sprays against some of the people who, 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 who were there. So people uh, exchange messages of don't take this street, take this other street, uh, because you know the police are you know pepper spraying people in, in here. And so that allow also, uh, uh, there is a now in an, in an infrastructure for, for, for organization uh, that did not exist before. And that as Coco said, is uh, worse in the immediately. It's not, uh, 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 there is no delays on, 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 on that. Another thing that is also uh, uh, new and is that the Cuban government also lost the monopoly on the narrative. And on, as Coco mentioned as well, on the symbols on the uh, imaginary, on the political imaginary. So, so far for, for, for decades, it was the Cuban regime, the one who produced the symbols who produced the discourses, who, pro who presented itself as being in the right side of history. Uh, and now for the first time, uh, it seems for to many people that the right side of history is not <laughs> the side of the Cuban government anymore, but the other side. And even if, as Coco showed in her presentation, a lot of uh, graphic designers and Ari has been repurposing symbols that were associated with the revolutionary discourse, there are many other new symbols that have been created, especially for uh, photos and this the, that, that, that amazing photo of, of Michael Sorbo. No, it's not Michael Sorbo, it was a protester uh, uh, atop, uh, on top of a, a car that was um, um, torn down by the protester with the Cuban flag, uh, the use of the Cuban flag uh, and the use of dress and the Cuban flag within nar nar nationalistic narrative is also uh, something that, uh, it, so the, the society uh, kind of uh, uh, appropriated the uh, uh, symbolic and the, the imaginary and it, the Cuban government is now on the reaction it's reacting and it's trying again to mobilize a society that it barely can mobilize the youth and produce symbols that are attractive to them. I could, I don't know if Coco want to also add. Sure. Um, I agree with everything that Maria said, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. This is a very dark moment. Uh, the San Isidro movement has been decimated by state security. Uh, you know, its two most visible members are in prison. They may be in prison for years. The rest of the San Isidro movement is outside the country, 
scrambling to try to find a way to survive, which is the situation of many of the members of 27N as well. And in, in addition to the figures that I'm seeing now, I mean, at the US-Mexico border, the largest number of people is Mexicans. The second largest number is Cubans. In the last six months, there's been like 86,000 Cubans have tried to leave the country. That's more than double the boat people crisis of 1994. People are leaving. The activists are leaving or being expelled. There are people who are literally like taken to the airport by state security and put on planes. Goodbye. Right. So, you know, in that kind of environment, you, and we can't really talk about things happening along the lines that they have were happening in the last couple of years because the people who did take to the streets uh were are not they are not there right now uh and you know the biggest effort to try to mobilize the general population was around the november 15th proposed protest by junior garcia and junior garcia left the country on november 15th okay and the police because they had the political police had advance notice of this they put the tanks out on the street, they threatened everybody, and it worked. Nobody went out. So, you know, the, the climate that existed during the pan in the high, high point of the pandemic, the fury about the deaths of Cubans in hospitals that were and were collapsing, the uh, you know, the destruction of the public health system, the food shortages, and all that, that anger and frustration. I mean, July 11th started because people were mad about blackouts. The first protest in San Antonio de los Baños was against the blackouts. Okay, it was against the living conditions in the summer. We're not there right now. And the people who, the guy who put the video on Facebook of the protest against the blackouts got six years in prison. So that this is having a, a real chilling effect. That's number one, the exodus and the chilling effect. Number two, the focus of activists right now is not on trying to get the government to change, to develop manifestos with agendas. The focus is on defending the people who are targeted, okay? So that's when you go on, you know, and listen to El Toque podcasts and this and that, that is what the conversation is about. It's about the families of the prisoners from 11th of July. It's kind of like what happened to the Black Panthers. They had an agenda and then they started getting arrested and then all their efforts started getting put on getting Huey Newton out of jail, on helping Eldridge Cleaver escape the country. That's where things are right now. So that's a different kind of political focus. And then the last thing, some wouldn't wouldn't agree with me, but I I would say that there is a, a very big um, as much as this is important in that the artists were very able to put the message out there that the Cuban people don't agree with the Cuban government. Um, there is not an organized political agenda coming from any sector of the opposition. It is a real chaos. Uh, you know, the, the, the opponents to the Cuban government range from neo-fascist right wing people in Miami who are really kind of offensive to me, but they are Cubans and they have a right to talk to people who call themselves socialists in Cuba. Right. There was this young kid who was put in prison with a, a, for putting up a sign that said socialism. Yes, but repression. No. So there is, you know, there is no unity among these things. There isn't a really well thought out political agenda. Even the manifestos of these two movements focus very much on civil liberties, but don't really have a theory of government. Um, and the, there is no one in the opposition who looks like a leader of a future Cuban government. And that alone gives the Cuban government an enormous amount of power. Cubans don't have a government in exile. They don't have a, a platform. They don't have an, an armed insurgent, insurgency the way they had in the 1950s. Uh, the political culture, as repressive as Batista was, there was enough of a democratic culture for there to be developed an alternative within that dictatorship. That is not happening in the Cuban system right now. So that uh, to me, that means there's a kind of gaping hole of like, what would the next step be beyond complaining about how bad this government is? I don't see there being a theory of that. I see a lot of smart intellectuals 
who you know know how to talk about Cuban history in a way that the government doesn't. But I don't see uh, you know an organized political resistance that could actually bring about a transition. And so that is uh, you know to me a problem. Um, and in the meantime, there's the whole issue of what's the relationship with the United States, which you know nationalists don't like to admit is a big deal, but it is a huge deal. Um, there is, there, you know, that there, 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 nothing's going to change in Cuba until the relationship with the United States changes. But then we had something, Coco, and uh, yes, that's why I said that disregarding of whatever the outcome is, and I don't see any for any in the in the foreseeable future uh, positive outcome. Uh, but I think that. Um, Um, I forgot what I was going to say. So go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I'm just, we have like a bunch of questions here. Oh, yeah, the organization, the organization, the organization. You mentioned the. I've seen that uh, uh, in order to have a government or in exile or something like a, a, a proposal former and and and, and with uh, we need to learn to train the muscle. And I think that's what I see this moment as something uh, positive because. I remember when the, the, the 13 or 16 negotiators entered the Minister of Culture on November 27, and they came out and they got, the Ministry of, Course of Culture gave them uh, a lot of promises, but there was nothing written, press did not, uh, but that's something that we all Cubans learn after the fact. So we thought that, yeah, we got, you know, the promise and then the ministry and the government did nothing with that. So that's not gonna happen again. What I mean is that in order to, organize and to come up with a serious and elaborate proposal, we first need to train the muscle of civil disobedience, civil protest, organization, uh, formulate, formulating ideas, uh, 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 exchange of opinions, uh, uh, public uh, creation of a public sphere and a civil society that's independent. And in that sense, I see that, 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 that we are moving towards that. And that includes extreme right activists and extreme left activists and everything in between. <laughs> yeah, I just, it's the, the only people who are not appearing are politicians. Everybody else is being very public. Intellectuals are very public now. Artists are very public now. And the so-called masses are very public now. But the, there, the, there isn't a political voice here. There isn't a voice of even, even the most organized, most statesmanlike activists, like of the Observatorio de Derechos Humanos de Cuba, that you know, go to the European Parliament, know the discourse of, of governance, they understand it. Their focus is very narrow. It is not on developing a, tran a government of transition. So an, the agenda is about freeing political prisoners, right? Taking Cuba to task on human rights. These are important things, but they're very limited in scope. And as some of it is about having spent 60 years in this system that basically paralyzed of uh, political engagement. But, you know, there are, I mean, there, it's not the only example in the world of people who have been living in an authoritarian system. And there are others who have, you know, elaborated a, a much more um, well-defined, shall we say, political agenda and broad-based uh, political agenda, and also have some sense of how to manage uh, the system economically, which is something that nobody in the opposition talks about. They say they want to have a kind of social democracy on the lines of Scandinavia, but Cuba doesn't have the economy to do that. And that's that's real. You know, that Cuba will never be Norway or Denmark because they don't have, the, the, those countries are rich in natural resources and industry that allow them to share their wealth with the population. And that's not Cuba's situation. And it won't be produced by going out in the street and protesting. Right. So, so we have to kind of contend with that reality, which I think will be a big slap in the face to the intellectuals that imagine themselves as like, well, we want to, you know, we want a Denmark. Right. And well, it takes a lot to make a Denmark. And I'm not so sure if that people are so clear about that. Um, but anyway, these are, you know, we can't even get there until yeah. you figure out until the situation with the United States is resolved. And uh, and then we'll see what happens from there because basically the you know the the rest of the world is pissed at the united states about the trade embargo and then that becomes cuba's excuse for not dealing with its own internal problems because they can blame the embargo on for all their problems 
right? So now they're going to go talk tomorrow. And, you know, the United States is saying, why are you, uh, you know, why are all you letting all these people leave the country? And the Cubans are saying, why are you um, imposing all the sanctions on us? That's why they want to leave, right? Um, and that, so the, and you're, it's very hard to change the terms of those conversations unless U.S. and Cuba have a different relationship from the one that they have now. Thank you both so much for these um, not future casting, but kind of um, important reminders of the way in which, right, even social quote, quote unquote socially engaged art, right, is not necessarily um, political action or political theory. Um, we do have, as Coco noted, many questions in the chat. So I'm going to try and draw a couple of them together. Um, and ask a related question, which we've kind of alluded to already, but I was hoping that we could talk a little bit about the diaspora or the kind of quote unquote exile community, right? People leave the island at a variety of moments in time and in a variety of different ways. Um, but I was hoping that we could kind of maybe think together about the role of that community dispersed globally in what has been happening um, and how the kind of preponderance of um, Cubans in various countries, including perhaps the United States, if we want to talk more about the US and the kind of complicated relationship there, um, how what what is the role of the, the diaspora um, in Maria's presentation, right? You talked about, you kind of alluded to the idea that maybe people who are not on the island, but still right living on the island emotionally and psychologically in some ways might have a role to play in all this. So I was thinking that maybe we could spend a few moments um, talking about that, because this also seems um, related to the central role of technology and everything that's been happening and the um, facility of communication. So, for example, I remember right having phone calls with family on the island like once a month or twice a month, and it was a whole big thing. Everybody was going to like get the card and we had to call. Right. And now I can just text my cousins and it's no problem using WhatsApp and that really has um, right revolutionized uh, the way in which information is exchanged, but also the way in which um, community and, and familial bonds, right, are, are being reinforced. So, yeah, well, take whatever of that yeah, you want I would, to talk I mean, about. There's a, lot, there's a lot to say about this, okay? Yes. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at mainstream American media and the left, for them, the exile community is quote unquote, the Miami mafia. And right. all Cuban exiles are crazy right wing Republicans who want to destroy the Castro regime. That is the position of 90% of American media, European media, and the left in this country. And I get asked about it all the, the Miami mafia. I really doubt that Americans would dare to refer to Jewish Americans who support Israel in the same way as they re refer to Cuban Americans. So I see that position as very problematic and even racist, and also very convenient because it serves as a rationalization for the left's not talking to people from the diaspora um, and not recognizing them as Cubans. If they're crazy, you don't have to talk to them. OK, so that's one end. At the other end, the exile, the uh, recently exiled intellectuals that run all the magazines online that are so uh, 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 admired now and that are very interesting, I Paper Media, El Estornudo, Diario de Cuba and all that. For them, the exiles are them, the people who just left. OK, and they don't necessarily recognize is all the other waves of exiles. But, you know, there was a wave of exiles in the 59 immediately who were allied with Batista. Then there's another wave in the early 60s who were, lost their property. Then there's another wave from the uh, 68 with the uh, ab ab abolition of all uh, uh, small businesses. Then there's another wave from Mariel. There's another wave from the rafter crisis. And then there's, you know, now more, more recent arrivals. These are all different waves. And in each wave has its own uh, kind of cadre of intellectuals that have represented dissidents at any moment. And what happens is that they get a lot of attention for a while and then they kind of fade out for the most part. Right. 
So, you know, in the in the early 90s, there were a bunch of intellectuals who also came who were, you know, during the special period or who were political prisoners who were released, whatever. And nobody really pays that much attention to them anymore. Uh, in the 80s, it was the Marien group. And, you know, I, I mean, uh, 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 Reynaldo Arenas was doing campaigns, uh, asking for referendums in Cuba with Nestor Almendros and all these guys. This is totally forgotten, right? So, you know, it, it, so there's that, that there's a, a chronology of exile waves. Um, and, you know, the, but the most recent arrivals, the, it's only them. They're the, they're the exiles. They, ellos son el exilio. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> and then there's also the problem of geography that, you know, for, for Americans, the, ex the Cubans are in Miami, but in reality, it is the largest population, but it is not the only one. And now there are, you know, there are half a million Cubans or so in New Jersey and the greater New York area. There are hundreds of thousands now in Europe, uh, mostly in Spain, but also in other parts of, of Europe. And there also is a growing uh, community of Cubans in Mexico. Uh, so uh, as well as, you know, other others scattered all over. It doesn't matter where I go in the world, I find a, a Cuban somehow. But <laughs> there are communities, there are substantial communities in all these different parts of the world. And they, many of those communities agitate politically. I mean, the ones in the United States have more political representation, right? The Miami Cubans have their Congress people. The uh, uh, New Jersey has, uh, uh, what's his name, Menendez, right? And, and others. Uh, representing their interests. So, you know, they it, it, that isn't the case in Spain. There are a lot of intellectuals who are Cuban in Spain, but there are no political representatives in the Spanish government who are Cuban. So, you know, they're, but they're, the Cubans are dispersed now um, and, uh, and they're of different social classes and different political stripes. But this idea that, yes, it's true that, you know, once upon a time, I had to wake up in the middle of the night for one well, one minute phone call with Cuba that would cost like 30 bucks. And now I can text people in the morning when I, I get up. That's true. But it's also true that the exiles have played an absolutely critical role, not just economically, but politically. The whole justification for repressing Cubans on the island was to keep them away from the bad Cubans who were abroad. OK, so it was like it was a split between like the good Cubans on the island, the good revolutionaries and the bad ones outside. And that rhetoric of the bad ones, la gusanería, los mercenarios, la CIA, la mafia de Miami, all of that has been going on since the 60s as a way to separate families, right? And a way to forge a, a split and to demand of Cubans on the island that they become different from, that they act differently from those who are on uh, the outside. And so that rhetoric now continues. I mean, when Yas Canel talks about media warfare against the government, he's basically saying that the exiles communicating on social me well, uh, media constitutes a media war against the Cuban government, right? So that the political function of the exiles is remains the same. Um, the speed of communication and the facility of communication has increased, but the money factor of Cubans uh, sending money, hey, I spent my whole childhood being deprived of things so my mom could send money to get this relative or that relative out of Cuba. Cuba exiles have been underwriting the Cuban government for 62 years. The first 10 years of the Cuban revolution, basically uh, the, the government cannibalized the wealth of the Cubans that left because they weren't allowed to take anything. So the government's coffers were filled with the money that belonged to Cubans, the land that belonged to Cubans, and every other form of tangible wealth that belonged to a Cuban who was forced to renounce it in order to leave. That's how they floated until the 70s when the Soviet Union stepped in. And then in 79, when they were running out of money, they decided to let exiles come back and charge them huge amounts of money to fill the coffers again. And with the dollarization of the economy, Economy in the 90s, guess who starts subsidizing the Cuban economy again? I mean, after tourism and medical missions, number three for hard currency is remittances from Cuban diaspora. So we are financing the revolution. We are financing, we have financed a revolution that many people disagree with, that many people fled from. And we continue to finance that revolution. Yeah, 
that, well, you mentioned everything I was going to say about the, yeah, the, the, not only the remittance or the property that was confiscated in Cuba, the cost of the passport, we pay the highest, uh, uh, the most expensive passport probably in the world, uh, uh, $800 cost uh, in, for a period of, on, of only six years. But I think that in the last years, we've seen also, and especially after or during the COVID epidemics, uh, uh, a change in the approach of the exile towards Cuba is not only those who are financing uh, uh, their their relative on an individual or family to family basis, but also there have emerged uh, a networks of solidarity within the Cuban exile community that have signed and, and collected a lot of money and medicines uh, to send to Cuba. And I think that we have to uh, give that more visibility because those are the kind of actions that might eventually begin to change the view of the exile community of the mafia, the Miami, and portray them as, you know, brothers and sisters and or the same uh, uh, transnational community of Cubans that are helping each other. Uh, another thing that also affects the Cuban exile is that uh, it's not only instrumentalized by the Cuban government, but also by groups within the United States that, you know, uh, portray the Cuban exile as lacking agency as, you know, a, a, uh, working for the CIA or for the US government instead of for their own interests. So everything that the Cubans in the United States claim or demand to the Cuban government or with the support of the US government is seen as, you know, an instrumentalization of the Cuban exile community by the US government instead of, you know, a coalition of interest uh, 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 and that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you both so much. So we are at time. Um, I don't want to, you know, ask anybody to stay beyond beyond 730. Um, but maybe we have time for one more question. Coco and Maria, do you have time for one more question? Maybe well, I'm like, I just feel kind of rude because we didn't respond to these questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> should I just run through some of them? Well, we we talked about a couple of them. I think maybe we can address Laura's question about the kind of use of symbols associated with the revolution. Yeah. Within I gonna, the kind could of I, could I just say something about Black Lives Matter? Because that's a big one for Americans. Sure. Okay. Yeah. OK, um, if you want to tackle so, that, go yeah. right ahead. <laughs> OK, so uh, the pro OK, in the reporting on July 11th protests, Many journalists, particularly progressive journalists, said that the protests were uh, generated by the fact that people were hungry, that this was about food and it was about COVID, okay? Now, it's true that people were hungry and it's true that people were shocked and horrified and dis dismayed at the collapsed public health system around COVID. That is true, okay? But people were not running through the streets saying, give me a vaccine, <laughs> okay? They were saying, down with the dictatorship, patri viva, freedom, liberta, liberta, liberta. Every video, every single video, they said that. So it shocked me that, you know, this was still the, 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 the assessment was people are hungry, people are hungry. Yeah, well, they're hungry, but they were hungry before. You know, they were, and they didn't, they didn't go out to march. So I think you have to see, but, you know, but, the uh, Black Lives Matter official position of, you know, basically saying that, you know, this is uh, the result of the embargo and so on, is the traditional position of the left, which is to say that Cuba's only problem is the embargo. Now, I think the embargo is a crappy policy. It didn't work. And all it has done is given the Cuban government an excuse not to deal with its own problems. So I'm in favor of lifting the embargo. That said, I am not in favor of using the embargo as a smokescreen that then prevents us from looking at the dysfunctionality of the Cuban government and its violations of human rights. That's it, because the embargo doesn't justify putting somebody in prison for 30 years because they threw a rock at a protest. 
which is what is happening. It doesn't justify holding uh, people who write articles that are critical of the government under house arrest for a year at a time. It doesn't justify uh, uh, harassing the families of activists and threatening to have everybody in the family lose their jobs if they don't shut down what one member of the family is doing. And that is a constant. OK, so I'm like, I, you could embargo, no embargo. I, I still want to be able to address those problems and have somebody on the left tell me why it is that every time we talk about those kinds of uh, that level of police repression in Cuba, they just want to talk about the embargo. I'm like, OK, we'll talk about the embargo, but talk to me about the other thing. OK, why does Black Lives Matter take that position? Because a lot of progressives take Cuban state media as if it were truth and they don't look at anybody and look at anything else. Uh, they also uh, accuse all independent journalism in Cuba of being CIA financed, which is false. There are some outlets that receive grants from the National Endowment of Democracy, but it, it, those, it, as far as I've done research into this, as far as I can tell, the NED is not putting a, um, a determinant on content. Uh, in other words, they're not acting editorially um, with the publications that they finance. And then there also are many outlets that are running simply on private money. On you know, Yoani Sanchez doesn't take money from any uh, foundation or any government entity for her Catorce y Medio. Uh, Tanya Bruguera doesn't take money from any entity for Instar. Uh, Cibercuba is financed by uh, 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 Cuban businessmen in, I believe, Spain. Uh, there are many uh, media outlets that don't get any money from the U.S. government. They might get some from the Swiss or from the Swedes or from the French, but not the American government, like El Toque and... and, and uh, uh, What's it called? The one Elena Diaz is one, Periodismo de Barrio. So, you know, really the media landscape in Cuba, the financing of the media landscape of independent media is much more diverse than most people on the left want to acknowledge. And the U.S. funding of it is actually minimal by comparison to the amount of money that Cubans put in. OK, U.S. Congress approved 17 million for Cuban pro-democracy pro activities of all kinds, not just media production. Cuban exiles send over $3 billion a year to Cubans. 17 million, 3 billion. Who's really running the show financially? I always point that out and know, but you know that people don't like to, it. they want it to be a CIA thing, but I'm like, we give $3 billion, you give 17 million. <laughs> You know, that's really not that much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Coco, you've written recently, too, that this idea that um, the Cuban government is the only spokesperson for Cuban people, in fact, right, diminishes the agency of people on the island to have an opinion that is contrary to the party line. And I think it's hard for some organizations and individuals both on the left and on the right to understand fully that Cuba is a totalitarian state and is more comparable to someplace like Russia or China, right, than someplace like the United States. People often want to make this comparison between the US and Cuba. We're close, but only in geography, right? Um, and we're intertwined economically and culturally, but very, very different um, ways of living and political systems and, and the ability to kind of, right, um, exercise one's civil rights and I mean, economic you know, rights. there are a lot of Republicans out there who are doing things that I really radically disagree with in terms of censorship and regulation of speech and all sorts of things. I mean, I would not want to be living in Florida right now. Um, but, uh, you know, there are there is enough of a diversified economy uh, that, you know, if the state imposes those kinds of restrictions in certain areas, there are other options because we have a diversified economy. And so people can finance those other options. You can finance a different kind of media or a different kind of publication. It might not be easy, but it's possible, right? right. And that's where, um, you know, that, that that's where the difference is. The extremism of some of the far right in this country is not that different from the extremism of the government in Cuba. It's just that they're not the only ones out there in the playing field. 
Right, exactly. Maria, did you want to tackle Laura's question about um, the kind of mythological past um, of the revolution and how it's being um, kind of deployed in different ways? You alluded to this a bit in your presentation. So maybe yes. you wanted to expand a little bit. Thank yes. you. Uh, I think that all there are different kind of efforts uh, within the Cuban uh, intellectual artistic community and even a uh, society in general that are trying to recover areas of the Cuban immediate revolutionary past that has been uh, forgotten or silenced or voices from uh, groups or minority groups or individuals that have been silenced. And uh, Laura mentions a uh, performance that it was actually organized uh, uh, by Coco Fusco, the, the reenactment of the uh, Padilla's uh, confession. Uh, but, you know, my own project of Cuban material is also a, a recovery of the material culture that uh, supported and in a way uh, uh, helped to legitimize the uh, political discourses and uh, of the Cuban regime. So, uh, I think that all these efforts, uh, Coco's uh, uh, performance, uh, Cuba material, and uh, many oral and, and, and cultural histories that have been produced uh, by the, within and outside the academia, me memoirs and, and the like, have all uh, uh, look uh, uh, have a purpose of of, of uh, bringing to light uh, a different narrative, uh, 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 co-opting you know, or uh, recovering the narrative that the Cuban regime had had uh, kidnapped and used for its own benefit. Yeah, Coco, did you want to add anything before we? Oh, our I don't know. I so feel much like to say. A lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both so much. I know that this was um, simultaneously a very focused topic that necessitated a really broad um, reach. And so I really appreciate everything that you shared with us today. Um, I found it absolutely wonderful. Um, so thank you both so, so very much. And thank you to everyone that attended and your excellent questions. And thank you to Elizabeth for um, offering the LePage Center resources for us to host. And last but definitely not least, I want to thank Andrina Soto Segura for her tireless efforts to wrangle the three of us um, <laughs> to get here today. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll turn it back over to Elizabeth to close us out. Sure, thank you. Thank you again to all of the panelists and to Hillary. This concludes our six month series on turning points in history. Our final event of the academic year will be on Monday, April 25th, where Dean Adele Lindenmeyer and um, Dr. Mike Westrate will join us to talk about historical turning points in the war in Ukraine. That'll be on Monday at 6 p.m. It'll be a virtual conversation and you can find more information on our website. So thank you again to everybody and have a very good evening.